to reintroduce to AV, well, I better not rephrase that. She is a member of AV's. This is Marguerite Fraser Bruard. She's a French lady. She was a French helper. And uh, she had a lot of U.S. airmen in Paris. Marguerite, take yes. it from there. I, what, uh, what do you want me to do? I want you to introduce and yourself. To introduce your guests and tell uh -huh. them about them and tell about yourself. Okay, I'm uh, Marguerite uh, Ruard Fraser and uh, I, I was a helper uh, during World War II when my, with my, my mother. I was only 15 and a half and uh, we had American airmen uh, in our apartment in Paris and uh, We we uh, we had thirteen all together. We used to we thirteen all together. We used to have to keep them about three weeks, uh, two at a time, until they had uh, cards and the, the trip to the uh, to the front line. Yes. And you know, to, to go into Spain mm -hmm. was arranged, and we we take them to uh, the uh, station to be taken. By guards, you, know, you take them to the radio station to take them no, to the no, base? No, to, 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 uh, to the station, train station. I'm sorry, not radio station. I'm, to the I'm, train station. <laughs> the train station, take them to the base of the Pyrenees where they walk across, across into Spain. Across the Pyrenees into Spain, yes. 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 And then from there they would be sent to, uh, to back to England. Very good. Yes. All right. What about, that's about you and your mom? My mother and, and, a, and, a, and a friend of my mother, we, we had met in, uh, we were in turn, my parents were British. Mm -hmm. So we were in, in concentration camp in the east of France. And my sister and I, uh, being on the 13, we, uh, on the 16, uh, the Germans released us uh, on the condition that we would stay in Paris uh, on the, uh, the German surveillance. We had to report to the police every single day, all throughout the war. And when I was 16, I was supposed to be put back in a concentration camp. Put in a concentration camp? At yeah, eight? because my parents were British, but they were from the oh. Channel Islands, from Guernsey and wow. Jersey. So, uh, but they forgot about me anyway. How could anyone forget about a beautiful lady like you? I, <laughs> the Germans must have been awful dumb. Yes, <laughs> it was getting towards the end of the war, so. So my, uh, we lived with, with that friend whom we had met in, uh, that was Besançon in the east of France. And uh, a friend of hers asked if we would mind uh, hiding American airmen in our, in our apartment. And so my mother and uh, her friend accepted. Uh, our <coughs> my father was in concentration camp all throughout the war. And uh, our friend's husband was in the, in the Air Force, in the British Air Force. So um, we, we just, you know, my mother and her friend and her two little children, my sister and I lived in an apartment in Paris. And uh, then we, you know, they accepted to hide American airmen and then we started uh, having, having them to buy to uh, for a period of three weeks each time. So in your apartment, you had to hide them, and you had to feed them, and you had to care for them, and That's give them right. a place to sleep. Mm -hmm. Yes, they usually slept they, in the master bedroom together, and then uh, my mother and Maud and your children and myself slept in another room. Mm -hmm. And uh, we shared the little food we had with them, which wasn't very much. You don't have to apologize. You didn't have very much, but you shared it with them. We shared it with them. What about the Germans uh, uh, sometimes coming out? They, sometimes they would, they would uh, just show up at the apartment to check on us to see if we were there, and then we had two American airmen hiding in, another, in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. And if they caught you? Well, we would have been probably uh, tortured and sent to Buchenwald or to some kind of camp like that. We had some friends who were captured and sent there. What did you think about all that at the time? Or were you even thinking about it? Uh, I think my mother and her friend were. But uh, uh, as for myself, being young, uh, I was very patriotic. And uh, I think that was a great experience and a great challenge. And I just uh, 
wanted to help and do anything I could to be free of the Germans. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. That's what, it, what about your, your, your gentleman here? Well, I don't know much about their lives, so I think he better, he better say it himself and I'll help him. Yes, sir. Your dad, were you a helper? Vous avez aidé pendant la guerre, parce que c'était votre père. Non, non, non. His father. Your dad was a father. I am born in 1952, after the war, seven years after the war. But my father was a helper. And what is your name, sir? Surname? Oui, votre nom. François. François, it's very French. François. But my father was Pierre. Pierre François. Pierre François. He was a farmer. Tell us about your father. Um, How he helped and what he did. Yes, uh, it was um, September the 5th. Mm -hmm. um, he was, uh, as a farmer, he was harvesting in a field near a forest. And um, he, he heard a noise the, of, a, of a plane may, very, very low in the sky. Because usually he, he heard the, the bombers high in the sky. So the old uh, plane is, is crashing, and uh, <coughs> he, he didn't see a, a pilot dropping with uh, his parachute. Um, and uh, after a time, he saw a man um, getting out of the forest who came to, to him. Uh, <coughs> when he, he spoke with the, with the airman, um, the, the airman had, had a map, a plastic, plastic map, and host, uh, wh where I am. You are in France, but German enemies are all alone. So you you come with me, and I am going to... Hide. Hide. hide I am going to hide you in the forest. You don't move, you stay there, and in the night, I am going to take you. But an hour after, an underground man come to him and ask him if he had seen me. Yes. Uh, I, I have hidden him in the forest, mm -hmm. and you can come in the night. And in the night, so the pilot mm -hmm. and the co-pilot and underground man came to to take the, the, this airman who was the bombardier. Mm -hmm. so this is That's this right. Is okay. Okay. And uh, it's a, it, it was uh, the job of my father. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, my, my friend there is the son of a helper, who was an, under, an underground man who helped the pilot, co-pilot, and the bombardier, oh. who were hidden in a hole with two um, Russian workers who had escaped from mine. How long did you hide them? Or your father hide them? And how did he feed them? Uh, uh, his father, uh, three days, I think. Um, and a week. Um, but um, American army was not uh, very uh, very far from uh, from our village, and uh, we decided to take them to to the American line. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, three days after, um, an American jeep with uh, two or three soldiers came in the, in the village where uh, was hidden the, the pilot. But there was a problem, they, they were in an enemy territory. They didn't know that. So uh, they had to, to come back very fast to, to the line because the, the German enemy could uh, fall, fall on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took um, with them a pilot, co-pilot, uh, but they, they drove only one kilometer to the next village because Germans were there. Mm -hmm. So they have been hidden by, by uh, uh, French people of this village. And um, the day after, they could come to, to the American line. So you got them out to the American lands. With the Americans were coming east, and the Russians and the Germans were going east, and whatever it was, uh, you freed them. You 
got them into freedom. No, 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 no. He says that the Americans arrived at the other side. There were Russians who arrived at the other side, and they were freed from that way. Yes, but we have been the freedom camp with the American of the the third army of General Patton, and. But um, Russian were in, were in Germany. It's a, a, a very long. Uh, it was very, very long. What do you think of General Patton? Um, it's um, um, to me. It's um, I have a, a, admiration. Mm -hmm. uh, I have admiration for the, for the, for the, for this man. He's uh, buried uh, at uh, 50 kilometers from uh, my village mm -hmm. in uh, Luxembourg. In uh, Arm cemetery. Many uh, American soldiers uh, died uh, during the, the Battle of the Burge mm -hmm. in, in Belgium. Uh, and General Patton is buried with this man. Yes. Okay. And uh, I have a book with uh, snapshots of General Patton uh, who have been taken uh, at 20 kilometers from my, from my home. You think of General Patton like I do. We're a fraternity brothers from college. I didn't know General Patton, he was a lot older, but we were in the same college fraternity. Really? So, and I was very impressed with the way General Patton would fight a war. He wanted to win, and he did. He did. And she I did. know yeah. there are the people I've spoken with that there are a lot of monuments to General Patton all over Europe. And he's buried where? In Luxembourg. Luxembourg? Ham. Ham. Ham says he's buried in Ham. Ham, um, yeah. Yes. Cindy and I have been to uh, Luxembourg. And uh, in his daughter is living in, um, I am not sure, but I think that it's in Luxembourg mm -hmm. or Belgium. I may not remember. Now, how about you, sir? Your name oui. is. Maintenant, c'est votre tour. Oui, c'est pas facile. On va te dire, je m'appelle Michel. Oui, vous l'avez quelque ce qui comprend pas, je traduirai. Oui. Euh, bon, je donne mon nom. Oui, 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 votre nom. Père, ou oui, c'est votre père qui. Oui, votre, votre père. père. Alors, votre, le nom de votre père. His father's name. Euh, mon père était Monsieur Né Jean, né à Balieu. Jean. J E A N. Jean. Jean. Et son, son, c'est son prénom. Qu'est-ce que c'est son je, nom Né, c'est le nom. Jean, c'est le prénom. Ah, né Né. N-E-Y. -E -E Comme ah, le maréchal ah, né bon, de Ah oh, bon, voilà. Est-ce que son his uh, name was N-E-Y, né Then, then his uh, surname, second name, is Jean, uh, J-E-A-N. I never heard that name before, that's why. Né, Jean, that's his name. And his dad was a helper. So his dad was a helper. Alors qu'est-ce qu'il a fait votre père? Et he was not born in Normandy. Oui, il est né à Bayeux en Normandie. À Bayeux, non, à Bayeux en Lorraine. Ah, à Bayeux. Évidemment. Ah, Bayeux. C'est lié au X. Okay. He was born in in the east of France. Bayeux, B A L I E U X. B A S L I E U X. That's close enough. Ah, comme comme Don. Oui. Ah, ah, c'est deux, deux, deux. Non, non, mais c'est écrit ah, ensemble. C'est oui. Balieu, c'est-à-dire les lieux bas. Bon, B-A-S-L-I-E-U-X. B-A-S-L-I-E-U-X. Got it. Got it. I got, got it, it too. <laughs> <laughs> your dad was a helper, and how old were you when, when you, your father was helping? Quel âge aviez-vous quand votre père n'était pas né encore? Euh, si, moi je suis né en 38. He was born in 38. Je suis né en 38, au mois de mai 38. Et donc ça s'est passé en 43, 44. 44, 44. 44. Yeah. septembre 44. Donc j'avais un peu plus de 6 ans. 1, 2, 3, 6. Il était juste un peu plus de 6 ans. 6 et 1 ans. Vous ne vous souvenez pas de quelque chose, vous-même Est-ce que vous vous souvenez de quelque chose, vous-même moi, je me souviens, euh, je ne me souviens pas de, du moment où ils sont tombés et du moment où ils l'ont récupéré parce que je n'étais pas au courant. Euh, 
à l'époque, à l'époque, mon père, ça faisait 13 mois qu'il s'occupait de deux prisonniers russes qui étaient, euh, qui étaient cachés dans le bois avec... Donc, donc ils ont amené les Américains et les aviateurs américains où ils cachaient déjà des Russes. Uh, he doesn't remember exactly the, the crash or anything like that, but his father had been helping two Russian prisoners for about two years. Mm -hmm. And they, when there was a plane crash, those uh, Russian prisoners uh, brought the Americans to his father. Mm -hmm. Right? They got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. did, did, you, did you know what your parent, what your dad was doing? Or did you know what your pair was uh, doing? Est-ce que vous vous rendez compte de ce que votre père faisait Non, je n'étais pas au courant. Non, oui, il, 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 ma, mère, euh, ma mère était au courant, mais ma sœur et moi, euh, bon, j'avais une sœur à l'époque qui avait un an de moins, mm -hmm. et euh, là, nous, on ne savait pas. Non, il avait une petite sœur aussi, et l'un d'entre eux ne savait rien de ça. Good. They, they didn't have to be quiet, they didn't know. Non, ils ne savaient pas. Well, that's great. Well, thank you both for all three of you coming. Marguerite, would you like to... Uh, Stay a, a few minutes and let okay. us uh, mm -hmm. continue with you. All right, all right. Okay, or if you like to. Qu'est-ce qui est arrivé aux Américains que votre père a caché? Ben, disons que moi, ce que je, ce que je me rappelle des Américains, c'est le jour où euh, une Jeep est venue les rechercher. Ah bon. Qu'est-ce que j'ai raconté? Ah, vous l'avez raconté. C'est ce qu'il a raconté. D'accord. You can, you can just stay here. I mean, we, vous pouvez we rester si vous voulez, mais si, si vous voulez retourner dans le. Oh, salle d'accueil parce qu'il veut me demander d'autres questions. Pas de problème. Bah, bah vous allez vous ennuyer là. Je voudrais, bah, je voudrais quand même ajouter quelque chose. Il veut ajouter quelque chose. Je voudrais ajouter une question. Il y a des enquêtes, c'est une enquête, c'est ça Oui. Ah, mm -hmm. oui qui a été fait par... Et un livre a été écrit sur toutes les planètes où les planètes qui ont été crashées dans le... In our country, and in your region, in your region, I have I have counted fifteen planes that had crashed because it was the line of the of the bombers to to Germany. I can see you five miles around my village. I can count two. 24 liberators, yes. um, uh, 26, uh, two B-17, mm -hmm. uh, B-51 Mustang, yes. uh, and maybe others uh, that I don't know. Mm -hmm. A lot of planes flew around yeah. your village, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. But uh, many uh, pilots or crew members died in the crash. Yes, uh -huh. that's, that's war. Uh, hold it a second. Turn it okay. yeah. um, our village was uh, occupied by um, by German enemy. Okay, um, hold it again. Start again. In, uh, in I'm rolling. Right. I'm rolling. Right. 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 Your village was occupied by German. Yes, uh, uh, in September. Mm -hmm. Beginning of September, mm -hmm. our village was occupied by German enemy because they were retreating, mm -hmm. and uh, um, the, the 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 road near our home was um, the passage yeah. of the German soldiers, and there were many problems uh, because uh, uh, underground uh, people shot. On German soldiers, mm -hmm. and they were very um, mission. Well, yes, they, they were very upset about it, and they wanted revenge. Yes, yes. And um, uh, two two civilian people were died in our village because the German shot at them. Mm -hmm. And um, when the underground um, want, wanted to escape, they um, they went across mm -hmm. the, the barn of my. Of my parents, mm -hmm. and uh, they let their guns there, and my my mother saw that in, and say them, take your guns because if German soldiers come there, we are going to be uh, uh, shot too, and um, <coughs> in the in the afternoon, my father and my uncle have been taken by German soldiers, and when they 
they have been um, be before war. They think that they they were go going to be to be shot, but uh, German soldiers were were speaking to uh, each other, and uh, they decided uh, not 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 to shoot because, uh, like Americans were when here, they were afraid by the the fact that if they were taken, to to be shot, shot uh, them, uh, mm -hmm. themselves because they, it's not it's not good to 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 shoot um, civilians. Yes. If you you excuse my English. No. And uh, well. <laughs> another, another day, uh, a general in the night came. A, a German general came in our home, and they wanted to eat uh, French fries. And my mother had not French fries, mm -hmm. so um, she she baked potatoes. And uh, when she she gave the, the potatoes to to the general, he was not happy. So many German soldiers were, were there, they, we, who occupied the, the house, and um, she called uh, an officer who was was there, and uh, good good Fried, uh, the the uh, the officer said yes, good Fried, and the general who. Um, he didn't dare. He didn't dare complain. Well, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't complain know. because it was a um, uh, caprice. Yeah, he, it was. He, he just uh, he fancied the French fries, yeah. and he wasn't given any. Well, he no, didn't yeah. want to complain in front of <laughs> and the other soldiers. Yes, many uh, German soldiers uh, had, had not to eat, and um, oh, they were. Uh, C'est à peu près tout, je crois. Oui, C'est très difficile. Un autre jour, un officier officer qui était affreux parce que l'Américain était near uh, entered the, the home and uh, with his pistol um, menacé. Yeah, he threatened. He, he threatened my, my mother. And my mother uh, said, no, no, no problem. Uh, German lines are there you you go and you and will be quiet mm, yeah they the germans wanted to leave yes because the allies were coming in and they didn't want to get in trouble so your mother says get out of here that's, that's right. a good uh, that's a good thing for him mm -hmm. to do he probably got back to german germany and uh, saved his she mother might have saved his life Talking Spanish now, Sumadri. Uh, <laughs> <I'm there. laughs> well, I better not try and mix languages. <laughs> Thank you very much, Francois. Thank you, Mary Jean. Okay. We, we are son of the helpers. So my surname is Henry, and his surname is Michel. <laughs> oh. Michel and Henri. Oh, okay. It's 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 uh, their father's name. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. We'll just cover that part again. Okay. Anytime. And this yeah. is Yes, so after my my father and my mother lived in Normandy and my sister. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> that's where my father was arrested by the Germans when they, they uh, arrived in Normandy. And uh, my mother knew the uh, head of the French police in, in Caen, in Normandy, and he told her that she, if she had family in Paris, she and my sister should go there because otherwise she, being British, she might be arrested as well. So she came to Paris where I was with my aunt. But, uh, a few weeks later, the Germans came to arrest the three of us, took us to some uh, prisons in Paris, where we were kept for a whole day uh, with many of the, the British subjects. And then from there, we were taken to the East Station and put into trains that were going to go to Germany, where we were supposed to go. So they, they kept us in those trains for three days. And uh, 
while they were talking. With no were, facilities. No facilities at all. We were locked in those trains, old, old fashioned trains, wooden seats and so on, and all mixed men, women, uh, nuns, priests, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. And then we were taken to um, <coughs> those barracks uh, in Besançon called La Caserne Vauban, and uh, it was winter. And uh, they made, a, made us walk through the town, you know, with uh, Germans on each, each side with their machine guns, and uh, we just w walked there, we arrived there. It was a filthy, filthy place. And we just rushed to find some rooms where we could stay. My mother found a room uh, where we, we stayed with uh, another lady and her son. And uh, <coughs> we were seven all together in, in that room. And we had bunk beds and uh, with uh, straw mattresses. They gave us some uh, covers to put over those mattresses that were little white and blue checks and we got up the next morning we were all blue all blue yeah. all blue there was an old stove in the middle of the room and we had to find some coal in the camp and then uh, for food we had to find some empty dirty tins outside that uh, we washed the best we could and uh, uh, you know they queue up for some food uh, that the Germans had cooked and uh, there were no no bathrooms or anything like that. There, there were just some wooden facilities, you know, uh, all in some a line. Slats, yeah. Yeah, and as for uh, no showers or anything like that, just cold water in a big room where everybody washed, you know, all over um, cement sink, you know, and with yeah. uh, cold water. And in the book, it said some people fell in the yes. spots. Yes. And also, you read that book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's true. <coughs> my mother, <coughs> my, <coughs> my mother was very sick because she couldn't eat anything, and uh, it, so it went on like for about six months. And then after after a few weeks, we um, started receiving uh, parcels from uh, the American Red Cross, and those those parcels were uh, packed by the Quakers from this country, and. Uh, they, they were beautiful. I mean, we, we got one parcel a month, and uh, that was wonderful. One parcel a month? Yeah. Oh, Lord. But anyway, they, they, as I said, that was a big treat. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then the, the life got organized in the camp. People started doing different things. We were given um, uniforms of the uh, soldiers from World War One because we, we hadn't brought any clothes with us or anything like that at all. So we had those pale blue uniforms that the soldiers of the nine, um, 1914 war wore, that's right. <coughs> uh, and then afterwards we, we you know, started organizing us, ourselves. There were some French uh, soldiers that were prisoners there as well, and they were allowed to go out, so they got a few things in shops for us and things like that. Then after a few months, the uh, Germans decided that the women with children under 16 uh, could go back home. Uh, <coughs> in, in our case, we were not allowed to go to our home because it was in Normandy and it was too close to the coast. And I don't know what they were afraid of. But so they, um, my mother said she had a uh, aunt in Paris where, with whom we could stay. So they said, OK, so we went back to stay with my aunt in Paris. And in the meantime, our friend, uh, we had made some friends with another young woman who had two little children, uh, Maud Couve, and her husband was in the Royal Air Force, he was in England. So she had an apartment in Paris, and she was also liberated. And she just said to my mother, I'm alone in that big apartment, if you want to, you, can, you and uh, your daughters can come and stay with me. So, my mother decided to go and uh, stay with her. And, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, being British, as I told you, they were uh, obliged, we were all obliged to go to the uh, police station every day to sign our names, and we were not allowed to be out after dark or uh, have a telephone or radio or anything like that. But we did have a, a, a small radio. Of course, you probably radio. had one anyway. Had a, not a telephone, but a radio anyway. And then uh, in 1943, then when you know the uh, American 
went into war and started going over to Germany to bombard uh, Germany and all that kind of thing. Um, a, f a friend of Maud, uh, asked, who was in the uh, French resistance, asked her if she and my mother would accept to hide American airmen. So that's how it started. So we, we started, uh, we got contacts and uh, we started having uh, having them two by two. The two first ones, the first one was a Canadian, Gordon Spencer, then an American. They stayed three weeks with us and then it went on like that uh, until uh, one, the two last ones we had uh, were suspected to be German spies and they acted very strangely and they had been acti acting strangely in other places so our apartment was being watched and they were being watched and uh, when we were out they went through our papers and uh, their behavior was very strange so it was decided that, that uh, we would get rid of them. So a, f a f friend of ours uh, took them along the Seine and they were shot. Then after that we had one more Englishman and um, Jim Kennedy and he uh, he was supposed to be a spy and there were posters all over Paris saying that uh, there would be a very large reward for whoever said where he was, you know. Mm -hmm. So he only stayed two days with us and he was taken away and we were told we were not allowed to keep any more uh, airmen after that. Mm -hmm. But uh, some of our friends had been mm -hmm. caught. There was uh, one lady, G German batch by, she was sent to Buchenwald. And my future mother-in-law was uh, also followed, and she had to uh, to move from where she was. And we we uh, were told that there were people watching our apartment as well. So that was the end of it. Well, Marguerite, that's a beautiful story. I want to thank you so much for coming You're in. Much. You're welcome. I'm still enamored with uh, Athes and all of the helpers and all of the guys that were down and the way that. You all still get together? Yes. Yeah, we were lucky because all the ones that uh, we hid, um, and my mother and Maud would also take some back and forth to different places mm -hmm. besides the, the ones that we were hiding. And I also used to write some papers at, at my school for the uh, underground and things like that. Where do you live now? I live in Arizona since uh, seven months. In, in Sedona? Uh, yes. Where in Arizona? In Sedona. Sedona, Arizona. Mm -hmm. well, that's quite a change from France. It is. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, honey. You okay. We're speaking now with Mr. Edward Miller from Sedona, Arizona. When he enlisted in the Air Force, uh, Army Air Force. He was from Brooklyn or Long Island along in there. He became a B-24 pilot age 23. On a fifth mission on Ludwigshaven, Germany, Germany. something happened. What happened, Ed? Well, we lost one engine at a time. And we uh, were struggling along actually on a, about an engine and a half. And we lost the formation entirely and we were losing altitude and we got somewhere in East France and we got hit by another burst of flak and that put the last engine out of commission and put the flame pl uh, plane on fire so uh, we bailed out at 13,000 feet. You had a flying glider, a burning glider. Well they don't make good gliders. But uh, before you got there, had you had gotten to Ludwigshaven? Oh yeah, we were on our way home. On your way home, and you got jumped by, or hit we, by flak? We got hit by flak all the way. We got hit by flak going into the target. And actually, we it wasn't our airplane, and it was tail heavy. And we were having trouble keeping up with the formation to begin with, so mm -hmm. we were tail end Charlie, and we caught it. Taylor and Charlie wasn't a very good uh, for place to be in a formation, that's for sure. No, we found that out. And mm -hmm. once you started falling out, you were even worse than Taylor and Charlie. Well, luckily, uh, the fighters seemed to be 
chasing the formation, and they forgot about us. Or at least we were off sailing our own little way, and nobody bothered us. Okay, sir, now you're bailing out. Okay. Tell us what happened after that. Well, when I bailed out, I had heard people were shot at by the Luftwaffe or what have you, and I figured the longer I delayed the parachute drop opening, that uh, more chance I had of getting away. So I dropped almost that whole 13,000 feet before I opened the parachute. And actually, I opened it too late because they never told us to allow time for the parachute to open. So I hit almost as soon as the parachute opened. And I landed up in a radio station. Had a double barbed wire fence around it. And there was a sentry house there, three room sentry house. So I figured, well, I'm caught. So I just w went over the barbed wire fence and I went into the building, it was empty. I think they were off chasing another parachute. So I figured there's no sense in standing around and waiting for them. So I just took off and there were woods there and I ran through the woods and I was hopping over fences and walls. And uh, I just hid in the woods until nighttime and actually they never caught up to me. I heard later that they were just in back of me for about five days and then they lost track of me. Well, what were, how did you, uh, while you're out in the woods all alone? Yeah. How did you survive? Well, <clears throat> knowing I was in France, and I made a mistake one night, I should have been caught. Uh, I went to a house where they had money. It was a farm, and they had cows. And I went to the farmhouse and I was greeted by a surly, maybe 30-ish year old fellow. Girl came in and, who's that? And finally an old man came in and he says, who's that? And I said, an American pilot. And he said, have you had, this is all in French, which I understood at that time. And uh, he said, have you eaten? I said, no. He pushed the kid out of the chair and he said, sit down, he gave me breakfast. And all the time he said, when you leave here, you go out the door, you go to the right. And when I left and he walked to the door with me, he whispered in English, he says, go to the left. My son is gonna call the, the Germans. So I really should have been caught that day. But what I would do, I would go to houses where I knew they were poor and I would just say, je suis American, and most of them would give me a piece of bread or something like that, and sometimes I even slept overnight in some of those homes. And uh, I walked for, I think, five weeks, I'm not sure. I've lost track, that's a long time ago. Oh, yeah. And I finally, one night, this is January, so, I, and why I could walk, uh, so much, being that it was dark and people would be going to work, I'd kind of walk near a group like I was going to work too. I'd be just one of the people walking along the road. You stole some clothes. I was given some as I went along. Mm -hmm. And I really, I was still in my flying boots and that wasn't good because number one, my left ankle, I sprained that pretty badly on uh, landing. And the left foot, I had the out of fur boot, and I couldn't even zip it up. My ankle was swollen, and so. And on the other foot, I had four socks, the electric boot, and the flying boot zipped up, and it was still flopping around. So that's how much my foot was swollen. But in rubbing back and forth, and then finally somebody gave me a pair of shoes there were two sizes too big for me, and the sole was like a wound cord. Mm -hmm. And going back and forth, I got, uh, I got uh, blisters, and then I break, and then I get a blister where that had been, and what have you. So pretty soon my feet were in pretty bad shape. 
And this one night, it had been raining like mad, and I'm cold, and I'm hungry. And I hit this little town, it was Airvoeville in France, and I knocked on the door. Of course, I heard a woman and a couple of kids in there. And uh, she answered the door. I said, Je suis American. She said, Come on in. And uh, we were trying to converse. We didn't get along too well on that. She said, I'm going for my husband. I figured, Oh, you're going for the Gestapo, but go ahead. And then she brought back her husband, and he and I didn't get along on a language too well either. He said, I'll be back. I said, All right, you're getting the Gestapo. <clears throat> He came back with this little old man. The guy sticks his hand out and he says, where the hell did you come from? And I'm saying, gee, this French is beginning to sound like English. And I says, England. He says, no, nah, no, nah, in the States. I says, Brooklyn, New York. He says, hell, I lived in Manhattan for 15 years. He says, you come to my house, which was next door. And the name of his place was the Idle Hour. <laughs> yeah, he had everything. He played records for me and he was talking. I says, he says, nah, they call me the crazy American here anyway. So uh, I stayed with him, let my feet heal some, and uh, he said, uh, you can't look for help, he says, but I can look for you. So every day he'd get on his bike and off he'd go. And uh, we go back a minute. <clears throat> the first night, I said, you know, in America, we like a glass of water. And I said, I asked for a glass of water, and that's what pigs wallow in, or that's what you wash your feet with? He says, I'll fix you up. So he came back with this water glass, full, looked like water, and I go, gulp, gulp, and it was Calvados. I don't know if you've ever drank Calvados. Mm -hmm. It was 15 minutes before I could even squeak. <laughs> it is potent. White lightning, it's called. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, I stayed with him, and he finally got in touch with a mayor of a town who knew some boys from his town, boys being in the 20, early 20s, maybe late teens, who were in the black market in Paris, and they knew underground people. So one of them came down and picked me up, took me back to Paris, and I stayed with them, and that we'd interview, they'd actually interview different undergrounds. How do you get them out? Well, there were three main roads, as, as you probably know. There was a boat coming in from England or arranging for a plane to land or to go across the Pyrenees. And uh, they'd say, how do you do it? Well, we do it this way. What's your success rate? 50%, not good enough. Or how long is it gonna take you? Well, about five months, too long. No good. And they finally arranged to uh, give me to this one underground. And they were pretty well organized. I don't know if they had a name. And uh, they turned me over to them. And uh, I went across the Pyrenees and down into Spain. And then from Spain, went down to Gibraltar. And I got on a plane load of uh, British wounded out of Africa. And we flew up back up to England. I got back to the base two days before, the day before D-Day. So I actually got two missions in on D-Day, which the colonel let me fly him to get my flying time in, but I can't take credit for him because you weren't supposed to fly again. So You flew on D-Day? Yeah. Good Lord. Hmm. What was your closest call with the Germans? Well, there were lots of them. <laughs> um, well, I should have been caught one night. I was coming out of a French house, and it had a big gate. He opened the gate, and as he did, this German soldier, and I'm still in complete uniform, and this was only a few days after I'd been shot down, bumped into me in a full moon, and he said something which I understood, and I'm saying the same to you, fella. And there were 50 of them had taken over this man's house. And I looked in the window and there they were all dressed in there in uniform. And uh, I figured, well, if they're that, they're not that good, not like they're cracked up to be, they're not gonna catch me. And when I got to Paris, <clears throat> when this 
the, the uh, black market fellow picked me up. We uh, got in a train and went back up to Paris in the daytime. By this time I had clothes, you might say. <laughs> the, the, the Frenchman had given me a pair of his pants and he was a short man. They came to about halfway down my leg. So they got suspenders so that the top was here. So now they had to find a coat to hide the fact that the pants were there. And this train, when we pulled into the station, I thought it was a passenger train and uh, I'm enjoying the scenery and what have you. When we reached Paris, we were the next to the last car. The last car was a German 88 gun with a crew on it. There were two or one or two more passenger cars and the rest of the train was a German troop train. And there they are lined up on the platform. I walked down there, I felt like the reviewing general walking by him. And when we went down and got on the subway, it was like a New York subway, got pushed in. I found myself standing on the insteps of a German officer and went nose to nose. And he's glaring at me and I'm sweating bullets. And that train seemed to go forever. And finally, when I got off with this Frenchman, I said, I was standing on his feet the whole time. He says, good, he thought you were a Frenchman. <laughs> <laughs> and I found out later that they got me really dressed up. They got me a Chesterfield with a velvet collar and white silk gloves. I was, they all thought I was a collaborator. I'd go through some station or something. I'd get kicked in the shins, the elbows and the ribs. So, the Frenchman would yeah, the Frenchman would do it. They thought I was a collaborator. And I was like, come on, fellas, I'm on your side. <laughs> but uh, basically, uh, I spent some time in Paris with that underground group, and they couldn't get me out because the Germans were starting to go into a restaurant or a theater and physically arresting everybody and then checking their papers. Well, of course, my false papers never would have passed that. So they took me out to a town of Esbley. So I was nearer to Germany after a few months than I was when I was shot down. And they kept me out there for about five weeks, maybe, before they finally said the coast was clear. And then we took a train, went down to uh, Taub, went across the Pyrenees from there. and. Uh, we were in, interned in Spain for about a month or two, so... Uh, Until you got to Gibraltar? Yeah. The other, some of the other folks were telling us about crossing the Pyrenees at, at night. Were there paths or were there, uh, You had to stay real close together? Or well, what we had... <clears throat> this underground was pretty well organized, and they had three guides. Each one took us one-third of the way. And they had given me brand new ankle-high shoes. And I personally put the cleats in, like golf cleats. Mm -hmm. And three and a half days later, some of those cleats were worn smooth, some were gone altogether, and those shoes looked 30 years old. That Walking across the Pyrenees was no, uh, okay. no, no piece of cake. But and each one of these guys took us. Sometimes we walked in the daytime, but mostly we walked at night. And there were three Americans, counting myself, a French doctor and his son, teenager, that the, the Gestapo was after, and a young Frenchman that wanted to uh, join de Gaulle for the uh, army to free, help free France. So. There were only six of us, so that. Yeah. I had one of the other interviews that we did here said some of the Frenchmen would uh, uh, take them to cross the Pyrenees, but turn them over to the Germans for at least uh, bread or money. Or do you know anything about that? I learned about it afterwards, and even the Spanish would turn you back over for money. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that, so we thought we were perfectly safe when we got into Spain. They put you in jail there? No, but uh, it was funny. We we got down and we found a farmhouse. And he fed us, but he stalled and stalled and stalled. And I realized later 
he'd sent one of his sons into town. And then we were walking along, and then this soldier would pop up out of the grass and never looked at us, you know. We didn't exist, but by the time we reached town, there were about four soldiers and guns, mm -hmm. and they took us into this courtyard of the worst, ugliest looking prison that I've ever seen. And we're just standing there, everybody's standing around. And all of a sudden, this man comes running down the street, and he goes around, and he starts to hand out ammunition to the soldiers. And I says, uh-oh. <laughs> now they have guns no, uh -oh. and ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> well, they took us in to interview us. And at that particular time, I understood French quite very well and Spanish pretty well. And they got a, I wouldn't admit to the Spanish, and they got this Spanish girl that spoke French and Spanish. So this major is sitting there being very official, and they ask a question in Spanish, and she'd translate it to French, and then I would translate it to English. And if we didn't like the answer, I'd change it. And I knew that she changed it if she didn't like it, but he writes it all down, you know. And uh, I was still worrying, and I'd taken, I had a gold ring, and I'd put it in my pocket, and they searched me, and he found the ring, and he says, put it on your finger. On your finger, it's a, a ring, it's an ornament. In your pocket, it's money. So I figure, hey, if they're being that way, it's all right. So after this interview, they took us out for dinner, and then they put us up in private homes. And it's the cleanest bed I have ever slept in in my life. And the next morning, we came out, and we had to look all over for these guards. This was the Guard Seville. It was a border patrol. And I guess it was the biggest thing that ever happened in their lives. And we looked around for them. We finally found them in a guardhouse playing cards. And we said, hey, we want to eat. And they picked up the guns, and they hold it in our backs, and we walked through town with the guns in our backs. And when we got out of town somewhere, we carried the guns. <laughs> it was really funny. And then when they took us on the bus, they sat in back of us. And when we'd come to a town, they'd pick the guns up and hold it on our back and out the window, American pilots, you know. <laughs> it was really funny. But uh, that's basically some of the things that happened. That's very interesting, Ed. And you presented it so well. I don't know what else to add. Can you think of anything else you'd like to add? Well, I can tell you a story that uh, I know some people say, I can't believe it's true. Okay. They, th these fellas used to take me all over. And Marguerite thought I was, you shouldn't have done that. You should have hidden. And I worked on the principle that if you walk around and act as though you belong, nobody's going to bother you. And that's the way it worked out. Because I would walk around Paris in the daytime, and uh, Germans all over the place. And I, this one time, we went up, and I'm looking at the tomb of the unknown soldier in the Arc de Triomphe. Mm -hmm. And I feel this on my shoulder, and I turn around. It's a German soldier. I figure, OK, I'm caught. Well, he wanted to take a picture of it, so he wanted me to move over. Well, he couldn't handle his rifle and the camera at the same time. He hands me his rifle. And I'm standing there looking at his rifle. He took the picture, and then he grabbed the rifle and walked away. And the Frenchman came over, and he says, why didn't you shoot him? I says, what, with a thousand Germans armed, and I'm going to shoot this one guy that's dumb enough to be uh, an ally of ours? So little things like that. I had, I had some interesting things happen. Yeah, but. It, it, as I look at it this way. Uh, compared to most of the other people, I had it very easy. And, uh, That's because of your personality, Ed Miller. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it is, because you knew what to do, you knew what to get away with, and well, you did it. Well, I was, uh, what, 23 years old, and therefore I could lick the world, right? Yeah, you did. <laughs> and you did. And thank you so much. Well, thank you. Take care. We're speaking now with Yvonne Daly Brusselmans.
He's an American citizen now, thanks to the good graces of our country. But Yvonne, you got, uh, you were born in Belgium, and you have a long story to tell. How about starting, and uh, why are you with AFES now? I'm with AFES now because uh, many years ago, in, uh, in 1940, a minister knocked on our door and asked for help. And my mother, who is uh, half British, my grandmother was British, uh, said that she would help. And it started with one Canadian, one British, and uh, from then on, it just uh, was on and on until the Americans showed up uh, in 1942. And uh, at that time, uh, we had more Americans than British. We, um, she was credited eventually at the end of the war with uh, 132 Allied airmen saved. Uh, it, I always like to recall that uh, after D-Day, we were instructed not to put them on the escape route back to England, but to keep them. And she remained with 54 of them. Uh, at the end of the war, and she very proudly turned them over to the military uh, authorities, British authorities, at the Metropole Hotel, which is a hotel in Brussels. And uh, that we thought was the end of our involvement with the Allied Airmen. Well, it was not. And we became members of the Royal Air Force Escaping Society, which is the first organization, that, such an, an organization, that was uh, established in London by Lord Por Portals. She became the representative, the, the representative for Belgium uh, for 16 years. And we just looked after all the helpers and all the people that had helped. Uh, Allied Airmen. She then became a member of the Canadian branch of the Royal Air Force Escaping Society, and in, as such, we visited many of our friends in Canada, and eventually, and of course, then met some of the, the AFIS people, the American ones. And uh, when we moved in 1981 to the United States, we were made members of the Air Force Escaping Society uh, and have enjoyed so much being with all of them for so many years. I eventually was um, very honored to be on the board of directors and as such help with some of the reunions. Um, we always felt that it was a 50-50 job. The airmen came over to free us from German occupation. And my mother always said that she felt that she would want somebody to do the same thing for her son, should he be in that position. Um, as I said, we started with a Canadian and a British. And uh, I have one uncle and two cousins. And we were told repeatedly that the men who were staying with us at the home, in my bed, and I was moved into the living room uh, on two armchairs put together for four years, uh, we were told that they were Flemish cousins. Now, why Flemish? It's because we spoke French, they spoke English, but of course, our French cousin, our Flemish cousins only spoke Flemish. So we ver reverted to British, which we all were quite conversable in. After 32 of these supposedly fr uh, Flemish cousins, I started to be concerned that having one uncle and two cousins, I just had too many cousins to account for that I had never met. One night, there was an air raid. I went down into the cellar, found the box, found the false ID, found the false papers, which I have a copy of here. Uh, and uh, we, I found these, which were blank ID cards that were eventually filled out in uh, from the records 
of a city that had been bombed. And that way, there was no records. The records had been destroyed. So it was not easy for the Germans to find out who these people actually were because there were no more records. So this was one of them. Each person under 35 had to have one of these two papers. One of them is what it's called a Werksteller pa paper. It allowed you, if you were not a utility person, utility meaning electricity or a gas water company, or if you were a doctor, to be on the road. If you were under 35 and did not have this paper, you were sent to Germany to work in their plants. These papers had to be taken from somewhere. So some of our people were, uh, 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 well, I'm not going to call them robbers, but they did infiltrate the town halls and stole the papers, a signature from the German commandant, and some of the cards and the stamps that had to go on these cards to make them valid. Uh, that was one part of my mother's work. I think that her main job, though, was, since she spoke such great English, uh, she was interrogating the men. And we had a, a questionnaire from, sent from England, and I have a copy of that, Oops, which is in here, which they had to fill out. Can we cut? Or oh, not. Hold on, hold on, hold on. And where are you stuck? Okay. Um, these questionnaires were originated in uh, in England, and we were supposed to, or my mother was supposed to ask these the questions, which was more than what a downed airman would be really willing to give, as you all you know. You were supposed to give your name, your uh, uh, rank, and your serial number. Well, we needed more information. At first, it was easy. We gave them a copy of this questionnaire. They filled out the information. And we were able, like on B-17s and B-24, to corroborate the story because we had the questionnaires, if they were alive, or alive and not, uh, and had escaped, corroborate the story. We, they knew who the pilot was. If we had the, the bombardier, we could corroborate the stories that they were giving. The Germans got wise to that and decided that the moles that they were sending were fighter pilots, one airplane, one pilot. It became a lot more difficult. And I have a, a, an anecdote that I think is worth relating, is that one man had been interrogated by my mother. His name was Reggie. He was an Australian. And Reggie just did not fit into the, the category that she thought was going to satisfy the host of the house where he was staying. The host of the house called my mother and said, I'm not happy with this man. I am sitting at the bottom of the stairs with a gun, and if he tries to go out, I will shoot him. So he suggested that we have a dinner, and that he would bring a bottle of wine. We would all go, we'd all sit, and have a dinner with the family and the airmen at which time, at the beginning, we would have a toast to the king of Belgium. Having done that, he said, we will remain seated. And if he, stand, if he doesn't stand up, we will know that he is a mole. Well, and after that, he said, we will drink to the king of uh, England. And if he doesn't stand up, being an Australian, and I, he's not, he was not, um, he was an Australian. Uh, we will definitely know that he's a mole, and then he will be taking 
a long walk in the woods and not come back. Uh, we went, we all had dinner, and we did the toast. We toasted to the King of Belgium, remained seated, and Reggie just remained seated. Same thing with the King of England. And there was an understanding look between my mother and the host, saying this one is on his way for a long walk. We were having coffee in the living room, and Reggie came by and said to my mother, and he said, you know, in, the, in uh, Australia, when we toast royalty, we stand up. And mother said, boy, you have just saved your life. And he looked at her and said, you would not have shot me, would you? And she said, I wouldn't have done it, but you would not have come out of that long walk in the woods. I have to say that none of the men that came through our hands were ever shot or ever <laughs> taken to the Germans. Um, I th the, the one thing that I think I need to go into is what, what did we do with these men while they were in, in, our, in our hands? We had to get them ready for trip back to freedom. We had to teach them to eat the right way, the European way, which was, you know, fork and knife, not to light a cigarette as if they were on an airfield, not jingle money in their pockets as like all Americans do. And if we took a man from one safe house to another, we if we thought that a German patrol was just a bit too interested in who we were talk we were walking with, uh, we would ask the airman a question to which he would have to answer no. There is no English speaking person who cannot linger on we without going e at the end. So if we thought that a patrol was just too involved, we would ask the airman a question, he would say no, and they usually sort of step away and, and let us go through. Um, mother never took me on any of the dangerous outings. I just went out a few times with men uh, to have their picture taken. I was interviewed by Sarah not too long ago, and I told them that, God, for, God help us, we don't have that problem. But if they were ever to have another picture made in their uh, survival kit, that they would have to be frontal picture. In the States, they're all side ones. Yvonne, your mother would send you out uh, with these men, but if you were caught, you were gone, and so was your mom. If you talked, and you were how old? I was 11 years old 11 when it started. But it, the the reason they went out is the Germans weren't suspicious if a man was walking with his little girl. That's right. Also, uh, we we had German moles in the schools, and we were still going to school, and. Uh, it's very difficult not to tell your best friend that you have this really good-looking young allied airman staying in your house, and sometimes we had three or four of them. So I think that uh, in those days I was less talkative than I am now. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're talkative now. There's a story about the Germans in your house when uh, there had some people in the back room. Tell us that story. All right. On the 1st of September, we thought that we had made it. We had never been arrested. We were safe. My mother was listening to the BBC at 9 o'clock, like we all did at that in those days, to get the messages back. And there was a ring. Uh, downstairs, we lived on the third floor of a, an apartment building, and it was after curfew. And after curfew, if a car stopped in front of your building, you knew that it were Germans. My father went down in the elevator, gave my mother time to switch the radio to a German station, 
because the first thing Germans would do if they came into your house was to feel the radio. If it was still hot, they knew you were listening to something that you should not be listening to. So she turned it to a, uh, a, a some German or Belgian authorized uh, station. She, she kept notes during the war, and she was also making envelopes with money, the last money to be given to the people who were sheltering the men. She shoveled all that under the trash can outside on the terrace, and up came two soldiers with two machine guns, which they installed in the hall. They wanted to search the apartment. In their room, in my parents' room, they went, there was no one. They came into my room, woke me up, and for 30 years, I could not stop thinking of the breastplate, which we're all aware of, this metal breastplate, the helmet, and the gun in my face. And I'm 14 years old by then, 14 or 15 years old. I screamed, uh, and they realized, of course, there was nobody in that room and wanted to go into my brother's room. My brother, thank God, was away in the country, and in that room was a young uh, Belgian soldier in full gear, ready to go and help the Allied uh, forces that were marching into Brussels. We could hear the cannons at the back, so that's why we thought we were pretty safe. So they wanted to go in that room, and Mother barred the room and said, I don't think I want you to go in that room. My little boy is sick. And they said, no, we need to go in there. We have to search the whole apartment. And she said, no, I, I, I would prefer you didn't. And at that time, and she was never able to explain that reflex that she had, she knew that there were two things that the Germans were scared of. One was to be caught in a cellar alone they were not even allowed to go down in a basement alone, or typhoid fever. And she said, I don't think you want to go in there. My little boy has typhoid fever. You have never seen two Germans, two machine guns leave the apartment, and we never <laughs> saw them again. And that was one of the two, time, the, the two times that we were scared. We were scared every day. Uh, you went on a streetcar, and as a young girl, my mother always made sure that we put our hands in our pockets, and if we had a hood to our coat, the hood on your coat, on your head, because if the tram search, if there was a tram search, the Germans, the, the people who should not have things with uh, uh, on their body, would slip it in the child's a pocket or hood, a gun, papers, or anything. So to save us from that, of course, it, was, it would have been terrible for us to be caught with anything because it would have brought them to our parents. So we were, we were scared a lot. And then there was the Allied I mean, and My father played a really big role in all of this because he had to think of his wife out and never knew whether she would be coming back from taking a safe a man from one place to another. Scary times. And Anne would uh, take food to him. She's always a caring mother. She was one sweetheart. I'm glad I got to know her. Uh, <clears throat> Yvonne, you mentioned something about the different escape routes. And tell us a little bit about that and also Rendezvous 127. All right. Uh, from anywhere in Holland or, f not France, Holland and Belgium, if you had airmen bailing out or crash landing, uh, they would eventually come to Brussels. From Brussels, in Brussels, we got them ready for the trip. Uh, there were about four or five escape lines. One I'm sure you heard of from Ralph Patton, which was the Shelburne line, 
there was a one line that went through Bi Biarritz, which is on the west coast of France. There was the one that went over the, uh, the Pyrenees, which we were a, a lot more uh, involved with. From Brussels, a courier would take them to Paris. From Paris, they went down to the, uh, the foot of the Pyrenees. And from there, they had a 20-hour walk over the Pyrenees in all kinds of weather, cross a river, and they were picked up by a car from the British consulate. From there, they were sent to, flown to Gibraltar, and from Gibraltar back to England, where they were reunited then with Allied lines. You ask about the book. The reason I wrote the book Belgium Rendezvous 1 to 7, is that one of the priorities of my in my life have been to keep her legacy alive. And uh, I retrace in there our lives as a middle class family looking after these young men. And you, the AFES has a motto. And that motto is, we will never forget. And we will never forget the airmen who came from a safe country into harm's way to help us regain our freedom. Remember that some of these airmen, and I know you've interviewed them, so many of them, Cappy, uh, are people, young men, who were 20, 21, 22 years old bailing out out of an airplane that probably on fire, bailing out behind enemy lines, not knowing who to trust, where they were. They were not, they were hurt sometimes. I think that we owe them, we owed them then, and we owe them now our freedom. And, and this is why I wanted the, my children, my child, my grandchildren, and it became uh, a story that was published and that has been circulated around the, the country. You know what, Yvonne? In your eyes, I see lots of things. I see love, I see dedication, I see sincerity, and I don't know what else to do other than say you're an absolute patriot in every sense of the word. We're so proud of you and your family. <laughs> now you've got me teary-eyed. I want to tell you that coming to the United States was a dream, a dream come true. I was involved with the uh, American Embassy uh, in the Air Research and Development Command and, and as such came to the United States on visits. And I always said that I would want to live here. We eventually came here, mother, my son, myself, I lost my husband, and I came over here. And I joined a group of people who have become my extended family, my friends, and you got me teary-eyed now when I talk about the order of the Dalians, military pilots who have adopted me, who have adopt, who adopted my mother, and gave her the I, okay, and who awarded her the highest distinction award from the. Order of the Dalians, which is a fraternity of military pilots. And I think that on this picture is my mother, the then wing commander at the base, the national commander, General Moore, and a dear, dear friend of mine, Cappy B. Whoops, I never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, uh, the Dalians, the uh, theory behind the Dedalians, of course, was the old Daedalus and Icarus, and Daedalus uh, stayed down where his low, escaping 
you know, the, the Icarus flew too close to the suns and his uh, whack melted off his wings, but that's the military pilots organization about the Vedalians, uh, Eddie. So uh, we want to bring that in there, but <clears throat> there is something else uh, I wanted to ask Ivana or get her to explain. Cut it a second. <coughs> All right, now I have to, to think about that because it's, it's a very sensitive situation with the INS. Uh, I've got to think what I'm going to say there um, because I don't want to... How did we come to the United States? Uh, we, lived, we, we, we lived in Belgium and I had lost my husband and had always wanted to come and live in the United States. Uh, so in 1981, after my husband passed away, we, I decided to come back because I wanted to give my son the freedom that I knew he would find in the United, in the United States. My mother at the time said, you know, I have all these boys, my boys, who are still in contact with us, and I'm going to come with you. So we went to the American Embassy and we applied for an immigration visa to immigrate. Uh, it was denied and it, they just went by the book. And I can understand this situation. We had to have a blood relative in the States and we did not. And having a Medal of Freedom with Silver Palm didn't, didn't come into the picture. So we went to the Canadians, and the Canadians gave us a visa immediately. So we said, all right, we'll go to Canada. And so we left for Canada, and I was able to get a job in the United States and came here, became a, per a permanent resident. My mother used to travel back and forth from Canada, where she was really well looked after by the Canadian Air Force uh, Escaping Society. But our object was, our ultimate object was to live in the United States together. So after six years of coming back and forth from Montreal where she was, uh, she spent Christmas once and had a heart attack. And the doctor said there's no way she can go back to Canada and live alone. We were, I was talking to uh, Ronald Pierce, who was a, who is a member of the Air Force Escaping Society and who lives in who lives in Atlanta. His son-in-law was a reporter on the Wall Street Journal. We never wanted to come in with the media uh, backing us up. We felt that if we were going to come into the states it was going to have to be through the big door. I, I explained to Ron that my mother was having trouble, and he said, Bill will make it, uh, will do something about this. He will put an article in the Wall Street Journal, which he did. And the heading was, America, uh, Anne Brusselmans was there for our boys during the war. Where is America now? President Reagan was coming back from California on Air Force One, read the article, instructed to the INS to be there the next day, which they were, and they made her a, pres uh, a, um, a resident, a, a resident alien. As such, she was able to enjoy her boys for six years, and six years she met them at every reunion that the Air Force Escaping Society had. Uh, they wanted to make her an American citizen, but she eventually passed away. I became an American citizen, and to this day it's one of my proudest moments is that I was supposed to be at the convention center in Tampa with 2,000 other men, and I mean people, to be sworn in. And the Dedalians at MacDill Air Force Base, Florida said, no way. Called a judge, a fed federal judge, called an INS agent, and in the presence 
and they didn't know about it. I kept it quiet from them until the end of the reunion, one of their monthly reunion. We brought the judge up, the INS up to the podium, and they swore me in as an American citizen. The, the noise, the uproar, the, the applause, the love, the hugs that, that, got, uh, that I got that day, I will never forget. And it still is bringing teary eyes when I do. Now you got me teary eyed too. <laughs> and I have one more story. Yeah. Can I? Please, okay. Sir. Which I think is brings my mother back in. As I, am I okay? I have 12 minutes left on the table. Oh gosh, I'm not going to talk 12 minutes, but <laughs> this story is good, I think. Um, as I told you, after the 6th of June, no more evacuation of the men. Why? Because the railroads were uh, bombed by the Allied troops, and we wanted to keep these men safe. They had been, some of them had been with us for six and nine months. So we were there with 54 airmen that had to be moved from one safe house to another. We visited them. We brought any books that we, prob that we possibly could have to help them pass the time. We also had to stop them from getting away on their own, one of them alive. On the 3rd of September, when we were liberated, there was an announcement on the radio saying, any downed airmen in Brussels, will you please report to the Metropole Hotel? We went down to the Metropole Hotel having heard that. And my mother met the military intelligence guy there. He was a lieutenant. He was an, a British lieutenant. said, I have 54 downed airmen, allied airmen. And he looked at her as if she were coming from Mars <laughs> and said, ma'am, are you sure they're Americans, uh, uh, British? And she said, I can go and get them if you give me three vans. He looked at her, he said, I can get you three vans. He said, but if you don't come back with 54 men, you're in trouble. So we went from one house to another, brought the airman and the helper to the Metropole Hotel. At that time, we just did not re record them at the, at right now, right then. So they all sat at tables and ordered champagne. And we heard a few of them say, just charge Madame Anne, because that was her nickname. Having heard that, my mother went back to the lieutenant and said, I want you to record every one of these men as being yours from now on, and you pick up the tab. She said, because by now, we have no money to pay for the amount of champagne that's being consumed here. We put them all on those, on those vans again. My father escorted them to Paris, handed them over to, at the Hotel Meurice to General Patton. And as they left that square, they gathered around her. Now, they didn't gather around her. They wanted to make sure that she was there with the vans. And they sang, for she's... <laughs> for she's a jolly good fellow. And the last we saw of them was them singing that song to her. My mother passed away. Actually, she was on her way to a convention. Uh, and had a, she fell. She never really made it after that and passed away in June of 1993. Her wishes were to be uh, sent back to England because her parents, well, her mother was a British. My husband is uh, in, buried in England, and so is Colin's uh, twin brother. Um, but the Dedalians wouldn't have it that way, and they, is, they had wanted to have a memorial service in the chapel at MacDill. I don't remember how many of not only 
that the Dalians, but the members that we had met at MacDill were present, and we had the Air Force Escaping Society. We had one of the men who is still alive, John Chernowski, who talked a little bit about her at the podium also. But I think that one thing that I remember is the way the uh, chaplain ended the meeting and said, when you go out tonight and you look up at the sky and you look at the stars, he said, there is a star that shines brighter than the others. And that one is Anne Brusselman's, my mother. Wonderful. And someone wrote a letter. Someone wrote a letter, which was a big surprise. It was a letter from President Reagan. President Reagan uh, said that in thought he wanted to be with us in celebrating Anne Brusselman's life as a courageous lady. And I will, I will never, ever be anything but a very, very small part, but a proud part of her life. Thank you, Yvonne. That was a beautiful interview, and thank you so much. <laughs>